talking about the base metal markets, uh, but I'm only going to focus on the two of our core products in base metals. That's uh, copper and, and the uh, zinc side of our business. Uh, obviously, we produce a variety of other base metal products in, in, uh, in these two uh, business units, uh, including lead, molybdenum, silver, gold, copper products, indium, germanium. But we'll just uh, stick to the, uh, the two core ones right now. Look at the uh, copper mine production profile, what we see between now and uh, 2023. Um, looking back uh, briefly, though, uh, from 2004 to 2012, there was only uh, approximately 200,000 tons of contained copper that was produced or increased between 2004 to 2012, or 2 million tons. If we look over the time period between 2012 and 2016, the net increase uh, will be about 5 million tons, or just over a million tons per year. After 2016, the closures due to and grade reductions will take effect, and we'll, lose a, and we'll lose approximately half a million tons per year in 2023, uh, unless we get additional new projects coming on stream. The net effect is that a rise in mine production by 2013 of only 1.5 million tons over the 2012 levels without the addition of new projects. The downward um, revisions to our demand projections uh, since the start of the year, uh, we still show a significant supply gap for mine copper still forecast to emerge uh, from 2017, unless new projects uh, currently in our pro uh, uh, probable and possible categories are developed. And we look at uh, projects and how they're slipping if we look at uh, some information from Wood Mackenzie, um, they listed back in 2008, 42 projects that were listed in the highly probable uh, category. Less than half of them have actually come into production uh, five years later. And on average, those that moved to the base case were delayed on average about two and a half years. If we look at the probable projects of the 67 projects in that category that were listed in 2008, only seven of, seven of those actually made to the production decision, and only two of those were of significant size. Andrew, is that in front of 50 million came, it should be greater than? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Let's move forward. Um, there are 15 highly probable projects on the list today, and 53 on a probable project list. Of those, close to 40% uh, of the increase will come from mines located in Chile. As we know, costs in Chile are likely to continue to rise despite a recent slowdown in mining activity. And these costs will be driven for need of energy and water. If you look on the demand side for copper, globally it's increasing. And while the focus remains on China and its continuing urbanization, which has been discussed previously, and a move towards uh, consumer culture, we're also seeing demand increase in other areas of the world. In developing countries like Brazil, Russia, Southeast Asia, we've seen positive demand for copper units in 2013 that we believe will carry forward. Demand is also very supportive of the United States, where automotive demand and production is up over 4% year to date. And we're seeing uh, this beginning signs of increase in construction spending for housing and commercial real estate. Similarly, in Europe, as Don uh, discussed earlier, we're seeing a uh, rebound in Europe, bouncing off the lows, and uh, we see improvement on the copper demand side in, in, uh, in Europe. In China, we've seen uh, good real demand growth coming through indicators other than the apparent consumption. The lack of reporting on the movement of stocks inside of China has obscured many people's views of what is taking place in China, where we have seen significant destocking take place in the Shanghai bonded warehouses at a time when we were seeing capacity utilization rates at wire and rod mills increase at double digit uh, rates over the last, uh, uh, last year's growth rates. For example, Sh Shanghai bonded warehouses, we, we, um, we believe about 300 to 400,000 tons have uh, been removed from the uh, Shanghai uh, bonded warehouses. This adds up to what, what's needed for the long-term mine production uh, for, to meet the demand profile. Despite what could be seen as a temporary, temporary 
short-term situation in the copper market. We believe that uh, based on current investment and build-out rates, copper mine production will growth will peak in 2016 and fall at about a rate of about 500,000 tons per year production after, afterwards. This will result in what we believe it will be a structural deficit in the copper market starting in late 2016, early 2017. Even if we were to add in all the highly probable projects, the, only defi the deficit will only move out slightly to 2018. Currently, the mine projects are being pushed back to lower prices, higher capex, um, uh, corporate security programs, and it's not only, uh, uh, so we see that the, these projects will continue to be pushed out in the, in the years ahead. When we look at the drivers, uh, which, uh, which regions of the world, um, it's been primarily an Asia-driven story, Asia-driven story, with China accounting for the lion's share of the growth. However, since the global financial crisis, there's been also a uh, surprising growth in the U.S. And, and Japan as well. Going forward, many are concerned about the growth levels in China falling from historic growth rates. We are forecasting lower growth rates in China falling year on year from 2013, with copper demand on average growing 4.6% out to 2023. But as is, as is imperative to hear, even at these lower growth rates, this is tr still translated to significantly increased demand for uh, physical copper units. To support this view, we have looked at global wire rod production, which accounts for about 74% of the global uh, copper demand. If we looked at planned and under construction wire rod mills in China, we can see the increase in demand from the plants continuing on a similar track out to 2023 before plateauing. If we combine this view of increased demand growth rates in other areas of the world, we'll continue to see strong demand co uh, for copper going forward over the next 10 years. Looking at China's specific 12th, fifth year plan, it, it definitely supports copper growth. They're going to invest in excess of 11 trillion RMB in the power industry in the next 10 years, improvements to urban infrastructure, improvements in the power plants, improvements to the power grid systems. And the power sector alone accounts, uh, represents 45% of the Chinese copper consumption. Turning to the zinc markets. Looking at the uh, openings increases, closures, and uh, uh, reductions in the, in the profile between uh, 2012 and 2023, we see that the, the net effect is uh, global mine production falling by 1.5 million tons contained zinc. As we've been discussed in the past, uh, we're seeing some big, long-life mines are coming to the end of their life. Uh, and this will, will have the, uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, provide, putting, pushing the market into structural deficit in the near future. On the same side, global refined demand continues to grow above trend. The historical trend is about 2.6% globally. We also, uh, uh, China continues to account for 43% of global zinc uh, consumption, up from 16% in 2000. So China continues to be the driver in the overall growth pattern. We've also seen strong growth in the in the zinc period in zinc in the period from 2000 to 2012. As eight of in the eight of those years, we've seen growth above the trend line of 2.6%. With galvanizing being the zinc's biggest end user uh, end use, it's grown on trend at 4% per year since 2000. The biggest growth has also been in China, where they've grown from uh, galvanized steel production of 2 million tons in, in the year 2000, and a 2% market share to 36 million tons in 2012, or a 27% uh, market share. Coming to the, the move to a structural deficit that uh, we, we expect to be uh, upon us in the very near future, we take our, uh, this, this graph shows the, uh, the mine production in, in, uh, in blue and including uh, secondary uh, zinc production as well. We take our base case mine production, convert it to metal, add in the secondary metal to come up with a total supply picture 
and we offset that against the metal consumption and the difference being the gap. The, what we see is that over the period shown here, we're going, going to have a negative growth period, a growth of uh, about 133,000 tons uh, contained per, uh, of zinc per year. So based on this view, we believe that the structural gap will start sometime in 2012. As Don's uh, uh, slide showed earlier uh, today, uh, LME stocks are coming down. Uh, they're down about 16% year to date. Shanghai stocks are down 22%. So we're seeing the, the physical uh, manifestation of this uh, drawdown on, on, the on the visible stocks, uh, but the structural deficit will uh, uh, kick in in 2015. And again, looking at what's the key driver regionally for, for zinc consumption is China. Asia has been the leader in the growth, uh, up 130% since 2000. But within uh, Asia, China has been the, uh, the growth, growth engine, up 327% since 2000. And since the global financial crisis, we've also seen cons uh, consumption rebound from the 2009 levels, both in the United States, Europe, and Asia. So it's just not strictly a China story, it's a global story. We looked at uh, uh, galvanized st steel sheet is the driver for zinc consumption. As we spoke before about the biggest end use, uh, approximately 55% of uh, zinc is used in uh, galvanizing steel. Production globally uh, dropped dramatically, about 40% as a uh, result of the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. Since then, we're, we're well above the, uh, the levels of uh, the, 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 the uh, the valley of the, uh, the, the cutbacks in 2009, we're up about 65% uh, by the end of third quarter of 2013. And China continues to be the growth up 127% since the, uh, the bottom of uh, 2009. So we look what the future potential for zinc uh, consumption is. 2012, China produced over 700 and 9 million tons of crude steel. Only uh, approximately 36 million tons was galvanized, about 5%. In 2012, the United States produced about 88 million tons of steel. 17 million tons was galvanized, approximately 19%. If you look at, uh, if China galvanized crude steel uh, at half the rate, 9.5% of the U.S. consumption, then zinc consumption in China would increase a further 2.7 million tons, or about 21% of the current global zinc consumption. A uh, good indicator is uh, Chinese auto pr uh, production is up 13% uh, year to date. And again, as China comes up the, uh, the curve for consumer durable items and uh, trying to improve the quality of their products, galvanized steel will uh, increase accordingly to, to fill that uh, demand for consumers. And that's a quick uh, summary of the uh, zinc and copper markets. Take any questions? All right, thanks very much. And uh, kick off with. Uh, Andrew, what do you think has been, or how much do you think has been, uh, and in the future as well, the impact of copper substitution? Copper substitution uh, uh, does, uh, it, it's. Um, Difficult to quantify, but the end uses that are most susceptible are um, uh, um, copper plumbing uh, for, for plumbing purposes applications. But copper, uh, its its uh, key characteristics of conductivity are are, are the the drivers for uh, copper uh, consumption, be it a conductivity for uh, electricity uh, and or heat or uh, or air conditioning units. So substitution is there in, in certain areas. Uh, but uh, the new applications, especially when you're uh, trying to uh, uh, reduce the carbon, uh, carbon footprint, increase the efficiencies of engines uh, and motors, electrical motors, copper intensive use will just go, uh, will replace any sub substitution aspect. Um, so the exact numbers, uh, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, the uh, International Copper Association does a, a great job in, in tracking that. But uh, the new uses, especially for the uh, uh, improved efficiencies of motors, is going to be a big driver for new consumption uh, for, for copper, as well as antimicrobial applications. So there, there's uh, always new applications that are being uh, 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 driven on, on the copper side. 
Uh, just a question about zinc. Uh, you know, in my view, the market's been overwhelmed by Chinese domestic production of zinc in terms of growth. What are you assuming um, that production grows by going forward? And do you have any visibility on how much can China increase their domestic production? The um, two sides to that, uh, the, uh, it's a smelter uh, production, uh, the capacity increases that have taken place over the last number of years, and now what we're seeing is some domestic mine production that's, that's coming on stream. Uh, on the domestic mine production, the, the, the statistics and the figures coming out of China are very uh, difficult to uh, reconcile, and uh, I think there's a, uh, a uniform view that the numbers coming out of China on domestic mine production is, uh, are not very accurate. Uh, the, what we do know is that uh, in China, the, the amount of mines that are operating are just literally in the thousands. It's very hard to, to keep track of. Uh, they're they're low-grade uh, surface uh, type of mining. So for the Chinese to, to continue the, uh, the growth rate in the mining side, uh, I think the general feeling is that it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to match their consumption growth rates for, for end use uh, for zinc. So on the mining side, they've had some uh, uh, Increases domestic mine production, but uh, it's not sustainable at the uh, at the rates we've been seeing. Uh, on the flip side, and the co final consumption, as I mentioned, on the uh, galvanizing side, uh, we we feel that the growth rates on galvanizing is very strong as uh, automotive production goes up. The quality of cars will get better. Uh, there'll be uh, galvanized uh, steel. So, as the consumer industry uh, 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 consumer demand for products uh, grows, so will the need for uh, galvanized steel. So. There's going to be a disconnect between domestic mine production and the consumer uh, uh, driven demand for galvanized steel. And, uh, any other questions? Karatosh. I had a, a question on your slide 11 where you've shown the uh, fork incremental transmission capacity in China, and uh, there seems to be a big increase in 2014 versus 13. S slide 11, please. Yeah. 11? Yeah. Uh, you're talking uh, copper there? Yeah. So as you can see in the uh, bottom left, there's a big increase in 2014 in the transmission capacity. So you think uh, that's the copper con that would be consumed for that has already been purchased, or you think we can see that lift in actual copper demand next year? Um, I'm trying to follow your your graph uh, that you're referring to. Is it the top graph on the uh, uh, the, uh, the the bottom gr graph? Right. The, yeah. So there's a very large increase in 2014 in the transmission capacity. Right. You think uh, uh, that copper has already been put in use, or you think we could see a major lift in demand next year? Well, that's we feel that, that, that there'll be a big lift in in the demand side for copper to fill that uh, the need for uh, uh, transmission capacity. I think. Um, we believe that the spending is uh, now the new government in place and implementing their uh, uh, the spending uh, programs for uh, um, transmission capability. There's been, there was a delay uh, of, um, of uh, spending in, in this area. Now that uh, that spending for the infrastructure, especially in the power sector, is is, uh, is gearing up again. And there is a time lag between uh, giving the green light for project to actually uh, consuming the copper for the final uh, uh, products uh, that they require. <coughs> 